Hello, dear chess friends. Uh, my name is Mateusz Kolosowski. I'm an international master from Poland. And uh, in this video, uh, I would like to show you um, two examples uh, which are connected with the king safety. Uh, something which in rook endgames is um, often forgotten. And uh, in fact, you are told rightfully that uh, you should be activating your kings in the end games because they, these are very valuable pieces um, worth as many as four points so a bit more than uh, a minor piece a bishop or a knight and a bit less than a rook which is worth five points um, and of course you do want to activate your kings play with them involve them in your actions uh, but at the same time it is necessary to take care of their safety so the first example is taken from uh, Vadim Zvegensev against Judith Polgar, the white player, uh, Russian Grandmaster, a very strong one. And uh, Judith Polgar, of course, needs no introduction, the best woman chess player in the history of chess. So in this position, uh, Zvegensev playing with white uh, made a strong move, which was also uh, the same or similar idea was depicted in uh, Aronian versus uh, Vallejo, so rook d7. If it's possible to infiltrate your opponent's position with a um, rook a move, um, putting the rook on the 7th or the 2nd rank re respectively, often this is the right way to go. And after rook d7, uh, Judith Polgar played rook takes b2, which is quite understandable. Uh, this is very unclear position and rook takes a2 uh, is of course the idea what black wants to do uh, is basically to make sure that the, the rook on a8 is going to be active even without moving it so if there is no pawn on a2 black is just going to push the pawn forward and the rook on a8 is going to become automatically um, active even though it's going to be in the corner of the board uh, and here Zvyaginsev realized that his biggest practical chance is to make threats on the black king. So uh, he played h6. And as you see, rook takes g6 is not a joke. This is quite a serious threat. If this happens, then Judith Polgar um, would have a very big difficulty in saving, uh, saving the game with um, uh, such a king on g8. Also h takes g7 looks quite uh, threatening because if that happens white can then uh, push the other pawn forward and the pawn on g7 is certainly uh, also um, a potential queen. Uh, so after h6 it was pretty pretty necessary to go g6 and Zvyaginsev played h5. So his intention is again quite clear. He wants to do. He wants to play h takes g6, and after the potential f takes g6, the rook comes with a check, uh, and both of the white rooks are going to be um, perfectly positioned against the uh, black king. So this required Judith Polgar to find um, not an easy way to defend. Um, one of the moves is certainly rook b6. We can put that on the board. The problem of rook b6 is that this is a very passive move. Uh, it's not Black is not attacking the pawn on a2 anymore. Uh, and also white can just improve his king's position. King e3 is a possibility. Mm, rook e7 is a possibility with the idea of taking the pawn on e4. So this is not really an ambitious move. Rook b6 fighting for the draw um, at best not really doing any, anything more than that. And also let's remember that at any point h takes g6 is still a viable option if rook takes g6, rook takes g6, f takes g6, rook takes b7. Uh, this might look like an innocent position from black's perspective because after all it is balanced materially but with white rook being much more active than the black rook and the white king being much more active than the black king, uh, I'm pretty sure that white is just strategically winning here. King e3, king takes e4, takes no time. Rook g7 followed by rook g6, also quite uh, a quick idea to win the pawn. So all of a sudden black may find himself in a position 
uh, with two pawns down. And this is, there is no coming back from such a situation. So rook b6 had to be rejected. And the other two options are g5. Let's take a quick look at this move. Uh, if g5 was played, then obviously rook takes g5. King f8 runs into h7. Possibly black should not be uh, allowing that. So instead, the only move that makes sense is king h7. Rook takes f7 check. King h6. Uh, but then there is a couple of strong moves for white. For instance, rook e5. Um, and the black king is actually not safe at all. There is rook f6 followed by rook e7. There is also some checkmate ideas could be could occur on the board. I can easily imagine something like rook takes a2 happening. Um, for instance, rook e6 check, king h5, um, rook g7. This is just for illustrative purposes. And then since the black king is cut off along the g file, if white somehow manages to transfer the rook, the other rook to h file, uh, it will be checkmate. So the black king is unsafe and therefore this is a risky position. I wouldn't really imagine such a sequence to occur on the board. Preferably rook f6, but uh, again, this is another situation where black risks too much. And therefore Judith Polgar opted for the best um, way of defending, which is to counterattack. And she went e3. The idea is very simple. If the king captures on e3, rook e8 comes with great force, uh, and black finally has all of his pieces, her pieces, uh, used very actively. And also, the white king at that point is not going to be uh, is not going to be safe. Uh, in fact, in the game there was king e3, and after rook e8, um, players agreed agreed to a draw. Uh, I can easily imagine a line like king f3, rook takes e2, pawn takes uh, g6, and for instance just rook f2. If the king to, goes to e3, rook e2, some repetition very likely. If the king goes to g3 instead, then uh, I think f takes g6 is perfectly playable. With those two rooks being placed on the second rank, uh, whenever the rook moves away from g uh, from g1, rook g2, and um, black finds enough counterplay, even by giving perpetual check in many instances. Uh, let's see just very click quickly what the alternative could have been, because this is also an interesting line. Uh, if Zvyaginsev went king f3 instead, uh, then the best possible defense here, uh, after analysis, this is in fact some in analysis indicated by Mike, Mark Dvoretsky, uh, who passed away not so long ago, unfortunately. Um, and he, he claimed that the right way for black to proceed here uh, was to play rook f8. And it might look like a very strange strange choice. After all, uh, I've been telling you that you need to use your, act your rooks actively. And the rook on f8 is just passively standing and protecting the pawn f7. But if you look at this position more closely, you realize that h takes g6 runs into f takes g6 with this covered check. And this is the trick here. So if we just put that on the board, pawn takes, pawn, pawn takes, king takes e3, uh, rook e8 check, king d3, rook e2, e2, rook g6, king h8. And both kings are very weak. They are going to be chased by respective rooks till the end of the game. But... Um, and even though the black king might be a little bit uh, uh, weaker at this point, the fact that black has this rook d2 or rook, the other rook to d2 trick with all of the series of checks along the second rank guarantees black enough activity, enough uh, drawing chances. And this is in fact just a draw. Um, I'm not sure what white, white's next move would be, but uh, I can imagine rook d6 for instance and uh, either with or rook g7 and either some simplifications take place on the board something like this for example uh, and this is pretty pretty essential draw none of the players can realistically think about winning this so um, king f3 was a much more interesting way to keep the game going but I also understand that uh, Zvegintsev realized that after king e3, 
uh, the game is about to, to be a draw and maybe it's not a good idea to push uh, push his luck on that day. Uh, so e3, tremendous way to save the game. I think without that, Judith Polgar would have been in great danger. Uh, and this is also for you to keep in mind for the future uh, endeavors that uh, you can save yourself in rook games by sometimes by attacking your opponent's king. And this is in fact going to be brilliantly depicted in the upcoming uh, example. So this is Andrei Volokitin against Albaron, uh, Ukrainian Grandmaster against Israeli Grandmaster um, in uh, European European Team Championship 2019. And in this position, uh, Tal Baron playing with Black just safeguarded both of his pawns being under attack currently with King G7. Logical move. Um, and currently White is White is under some sort of a problem. He has two pawns advantage but also if you look at this position there is as many as two pair of two pairs of doubled pawns and also the black rooks even though the, even though they are not placed in the standard standard active fashion like rook e2 hitting the pawns along the second rank they are still very active especially the one on on b8 and uh, at this point volokitin went rook f3 only now rook e2 so this rook is tremendously active, the other is also active, and this in fact compensates uh, black for his material deficit. Please also note that a move like rook a7 would be a horrific blunder due to rook e1 check, and checkmate eventually. So Volokitin had to uh, deal with this problem, and um, well, I think that at this point it was time for him to realize this is not going to be a win, he needed to play a move like... Uh, rook a to f1, maybe exchange the rooks the simplest way, uh, or just overdraw, really. Uh, and let's see what happened, because this backfired really, really badly. Um, the series of moves he, he's going to make is going to be, well, memorable for for him especially. Um, there was h3, rook b7. Uh, please note that rook takes b2 is inaccurate, because this allows rook a7, and white is finally activating his rook so first it's important to uh, use some preemptive measures rook b3 uh, rook b7 sorry covers a7 square and also maintains the pressure on the pawn on b3 so that's fully understandable and here volokitin played rook a2 um, and i remember l seeing this position for the first time and i couldn't really believe my eyes i couldn't understand what happened here but apparently um tal baron practiced chess studies a lot because by studying uh, by working on chess studies your creativity the level of your creativity creativity um grows tremendously here he found that the white king is about to be imprisoned and this is a huge liability this pawn formation does not give white sufficient protection um and I'm sure that Volokitin's plan involved playing g4, king h2, king g3. So what Baron played was g4. And if h takes g4, well, you don't really get to see such a pawn formation on every day. But this doesn't really matter. Um, because h takes g4 looks ugly, but there is more than that. Rook e1 check. King h2, rook d7. Because of this um, strangely positioned rook on a2, black is able to utilize uh, white's back rank by playing rook d2, d rook d7 to d1, threatening rook h1 checkmate. Um, Volokitin went g5, hoping to see h takes g5 and then g4 again, giving white the shelter on g3. But that never happened because what Baron played was h5. And again, this renews uh, the threat of checkmate. Um, and at this point, Volokitin tried again. He went g4, but after that, obviously, you probably already know the answer, h4. Controlling g3 square and making sure that the white king never escapes. 
If white played king h3 at this point, there is rook h1 checkmate. Again, a tactical motive you don't see often in the end games, but um, you do need to be aware of the existence of such uh, such ideas. Mm, there was rook f2, rook d to d1, and only now uh, g3. This does protect uh, white against the checkmate, but it's going to be lost for him anyway. Rook h1 check, king g2, h3 check, king f3, rook h to f1, and apparently there is no protection against h2 and h1 promoting and winning. For instance, if white played king e2, the easiest would be just rook f2 check, king f2, h2. As you see, this is picturesque. This is something again you don't see this very often but when you see this you can't really believe your eyes any move rook a7 i actually meant to play rook a8 um black promotes and wins so i think volokitin uh, overestimated his chances that's for 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 sure uh but that would never happen if only he applied the principles, the basic principles, I'm sure he knew about. Uh, rook a2 is just putting the rook on a very bad square, where the rook is not going to do much. He has no chances of winning this whatsoever, and yet he uh, he played this move, forgetting at the same time about his king um, safety. In fact, the king proved to be the decisive liability. So the lesson should be practice your studies. Uh, look for non-standard uh, non-standard continuations, but first and foremost, uh, keep in mind that king safety is a thing in in rook end games. Um, you cannot forget about that because this can really backfire uh, in a situation you don't want it to happen. Um, I hope you enjoyed, especially the second examples example because this is. Um, Quite a unique situation, seeing Grandmaster winning against another Grandmaster this way. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, there is one more thing that you will enjoy as well. Recently, I've been analyzing the results of different students of Thermo Chess Academy, and I've been checking who are the guys who got the greatest amount of progress. And it came down to the group of people who studied some of our most fundamental courses, such as the Grandmaster's Positional Understanding. And not only those guys study these courses, but they also really master the skill. And that's the level that helps you to gain three, sometimes even five additional hundred rating points just after mastering a certain one course. And that's why I've decided to open a new enrollment for this course. This way you're not just going to be studying the, you know, watching the video lessons, but you will also get my personal support. I'll be helping you in case you have any questions, you can ask them. You will also have the connection to the other students who are within the same group. And finally, you'll be also receiving certain tasks that will help you to practice and to master the skills necessary. That's why we're going to open up this enrollment, get a certain group of students that we can handle and provide my personal attention to, and then we're going to close the enrollment and stop accepting new students. So if you don't want to miss out, if you want to be in that group of people who are going to significantly improve their chess results after studying and mastering this program, check out the link down below and I'll see you there.